Well, that's, that's a nice way to start. So we, we, are, we are at five past and we are going to get kick started because uh, we know that this is getting close to the end of today's uh, uh, lineup. So thank you everyone for joining us here today to talk about ISPOs and OSPOs, our inner source program offices and open source program offices to make sure you're all in the same place or the right place, I should say. Um, but before we get kick started, I just want to get a show of hands. How many people here are familiar with inner source? Some, but not all. So we might do a quick, quick intro to that. But before we, before we do that, we might just introduce ourselves and, and the panel here, our illustrious panel here today to, 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 to share with you their wisdom. Um, so my name is Claire Dillon. Um, I have been involved in Inner Source Commons, which is a community around Inner Source for five, six years now. And I am currently a researcher with the University of Galway in Ireland, uh, focusing on inner source. Um, and I also work in some open source communities as well, but I'm here in my inner source hat on. Um, would you nice gentlemen like to introduce yourselves, please? Uh, yes, and I'll, I'll just add something uh, that you did not say, which was you were the inaugural executive director Wasn't of the inner source commons yes, uh, foundation. And my name is Russ Rutledge. Uh, I am now, I'm the second executive director of the InterSource Commons Foundation. And I'm also the director of InterSource at WellSky, which is a health technology company. So I have, I have both hats in relation to InterSource. And uh, my job there is responsible for InterSource and collaboration uh, across the company, in addition to my role in the InterSource Commons Foundation. Uh, so I'm Tom Sadler, I'm a Principal Software Engineer at the BBC, uh, working on connected TV applications, um, and I'm also uh, a board member of the Source Commons and currently the Treasurer. Um, so yeah, I've been, because um, I've we've been doing Source at the BBC for uh, maybe about six or seven years, um, and then been involved in the Source Commons, uh, sort of, yeah, sharing what we've learned for the last five years or so. Um, my day job is a little bit more open source focused now, but um, yeah, still, uh, yeah, love working with the Source community, so. Well, Tom, because we know that some people in the audience may not be so familiar with Source, maybe you'll give us a quick intro to your understanding of Source. Yeah, so um, Source is applying open source practices to uh, internal closed source code. Um, so this means that within a company, you can uh, have code shared across teams, across business units. You can have uh, multiple teams contributing to the code so they can unblock themselves rather than just like, kind of throwing requirements over at the, uh, the team who originally created the shared code. Thank you, Tom. And, and I'll add to that because when I first joined uh, Inner Source Commons, so many, in fact, Practically all of the people there had come from the open source community um, and there was a really strong, um, I suppose, connection between those people interested in inner source and using it as a step on the pathway to open source. So they were thinking about it in the context of just getting people ready to do open source in, in, the, in the wider world. Um, but in the last maybe couple of years, we've seen far more people become interested in inner source, not necessarily as a path to get to open source, though also as a path to get to open source, um, but also just as a way to do those kinds of unblocking silos that Tom was talking about. And it's turned up recently in Gartner hype cycles. We're very excited to be on a Gartner hype cycle. So it's turned up in the last two Gartner hype cycles of software engineering um, and in other reports uh, related to just developer productivity and, and collaboration in general. So that's very exciting for us. But, but we're here to Today, not to talk about necessarily inner source in general, but also very specifically the recent rise of inner source program offices, which is a relatively new concept. So, Russ, maybe you'll take us through inner source program offices and your experience with inner source comments around that. Sure, thanks. So I can say a few things about that. So, an inner source program office, I think, took its um, uh, lead and organizing and what it's called itself from open source program office or OSPO. So uh, inner source program office is an analogous part of the company, except instead of being responsible for open source, it's responsible for inner source within the organization. And that could be anything that the organization uh, needs in order for inner source to happen. Now, uh, like in OSPO, the InterSource Program Office are not the only ones working on InterSource project, but rather the role 
of the people who are working in the InterSource program office is to enable and make it easier for teams to do InterSource to, uh, to cross collaborate. Uh, that can mean different things and different companies, but there's usually a few different activities that seem pretty common across multiple companies that we see interact in the InterSource commons. A few common activities are things like um, culture change and promotion, um, making sure that people in the company are aware of InterSource and they're being trained to do InterSource, that there's recognition and celebration, uh, uh, ambassadorship and InterSource champions throughout the company, all of those types of culture change, whatever works at the company. That's one aspect. Another aspect that we see is uh, governance. What are some consistent expectations for running an InterSource project? This helps those who are interacting at the company with InterSource projects to have have a consistent experience and to be able to trust uh, InterSource to have confidence to use it. So setting what are those standards and training teams on them. And then the third kind of broad area, and all of these areas have like a ton of little things that can be done, done in them. But the third broad area that we see uh, that a, a program office or an ISPO could be responsible for is lowering the barrier to entry to participate. So things like deploying tooling at the company to make it easier for projects to be discovered or communicated about, affecting the company's software development lifecycle and processes. So there's little spots for InterSource to fit in in the way an engineer's work happens uh, during the day or during the week or month or quarter. Uh, those are places where an InterSource program office can help. Now, just one more thing I'll, I'll say about that uh, is uh, a lot of these uh, challenges around encouraging intersource at a company, they're shared between companies and not every company is entirely different. So in the intersource commons for the last year and a half or so, there's a working group for those who are in an intersource program office. It's the ISPO working group. Now, you might actually be assigned to work on InterSource at your company or just be interested on the side or as part of your job and making that happen. But the ISPO working group is for all those who want to scale and spread an InterSource uh, throughout the company. Um, oh, I'll just say one more thing. In addition to my one more thing, uh, which is as far as the uh, placement of the InterSource program office related to an OSPO, if you have one of your companies, uh, some companies, they don't have an OSPO of any kind, but they have a, an ISPO, someone responsible for InterSource. Uh, some have an OSPO and an ISPO in their sister or cousin teams or maybe in related parts of the organization. And then others we see where the OSPO and the ISPO is combined. And there's one team responsible for both open and InterSource. There's not one right answer. It depends on the culture uh, of the company, those who are involved and passionate in these areas, and the goals of the OSPO and ISPO. Claire talked about some companies having inner source as a goal, as a path to open source, and for others, the goal may be uh, not as related to open source, and that can affect where the ISPO or person or people responsible for inner source end up in the company. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks, Russ. And, and I suppose I'll add one more classification because there, there, there are all those that Russ added. And then there's the people that don't even call themselves an ISPO. So there's, there's, there, there are also organisations that look like ISPOs, smell like ISPOs, but are not called ISPOs. So we, we welcome all people who feel like they have an affinity with the goals of an ISPO in the context of that working group. But um, Tom, you are actually working on inner source programs, but also in the context, or BBC is in the context of their OSPO. So, you know, Russ has pointed out a, a very long list of things an ISPO might do. And I think for any of you who have been around the to do group or heard more about OSPOs uh, in that context, you'll have heard folks say, Anna always says it in every presentation, it's like my OSPO is not your OSPO. Everyone's OSPO is potentially different. And that is also the case with ISPO. So of all the long list that Russ outlined, not every ISPO covers all of those things. I think we, we, it's fair to say. Um, so maybe you can tell us your experience about what the BBC does from, from their perspective. Yes, yeah, so we, we kind of fall into that category where we're not calling ourselves an ISPO or an OSPO. Um, and um, we, we don't have kind of a, a fully staffed group. Um, we have 
um, some kind of you know, full-time staff time to support inner source and open source um, but quite a lot of the work is done by uh, a guild so I don't know if people are familiar with the, the guilds model but essentially um, it was uh, I think it was Spotify were people who were talking about it um, a few years ago uh, and the idea is that you give your staff 10% uh, time to work on um, a a business goal so it's it's not just 10% time for personal development um, it's 10% time towards a business goal that isn't getting fulfilled in your day job. Um, so we have uh, what we call the Open Development Guild. And um, so that's a community of people that are engaged in open source and inner source and want to try and make it better at the BBC. Um, we actually, um, so we're talking about inner source as uh, an enabler for open source. We actually kind of came from it uh, from the other angle. Uh, we realized that um, we actually weren't doing collaboration on our internal closed source code very well, but when we had open source BBC projects, um, all of a sudden people would contribute to them. It's like, well, why why do we have to make it open source just to get internal collaboration? Um, so we eventually found InnerSource and found uh, the InnerSource Commons community. Um, but yeah, as part of that, we put together this open development framework. And essentially, it's a, it's a maturity model um, that will give open source and inner source project maintainers an idea of like what sort of artifacts and documentation and processes uh, you, you would want or might want to consider um, in order to have a healthy inner source or open source project. So yeah, for us, it's generally quite merged. The, the maturity model kind of kind of similar, except you don't need a license. Um, and then things like access to your CI CD tooling, if it's in a source, it's a bit easier because maybe you can open up your code pipeline for us, um, whereas you couldn't do that for open source. So yeah, um, as I say, community led, um, trying to define best practices and share knowledge on best practices. Uh, and then the other side um, of, of our OSPO, ISPO activities is cataloging. Uh, so discoverability of uh, inner source projects is a, a challenge that we hear quite a lot in, in the inner source commons. Many companies will put together these amazing inner source projects, but nobody knows about them. Nobody's consuming them or contributing. So having some visibility, some advocacy, um, alongside the best practices and guidance for maintainers um, is something that we um, that we work on because we feel it's uh, something that will increase the the value. I, I just want to double down on that because I think you know certainly from from my perspective when you're when you're looking at business value that that organisations like open source program offices or now in, inner source program offices provide, there's sometimes a notion around collaborative development that once you make it visible and shareable and you have your license correct either in open source or inner source whether it, you know whatever context you're working in, that it just collaboration will magically happen. You know we'll, we'll teach them how to do it. We'll put it out there and suddenly we'll magic up collaboration from the ether because everyone really wants to do it all the time. Um, and we know that's not true in the open source community, right? It, it doesn't just happen by itself. Sometimes you need people to help grease the wheels, help make it discoverable, help tell people about it. We were just talking in the break before this about the potential for people to contribute to a project, not by contributing code, not even by touching GitHub, but perhaps just telling people about the project, speaking about it, helping raise awareness about the opportunities that surround it. Um, if that's true for open source, it's doubly true for inner source, where you know, in the context of a group of people who may not be motivated by doing stuff in their spare time, you know, for, for, you know, have intrinsic motivation to do it externally to work, but they're really busy in work where they've got a list of priorities. And now on top of that, they're magically expected to go and find extra projects to contribute to because they feel the need. That may not always happen. And I think one of the most important things that, that the experiences with inner source program offices and open source program offices have taught me from talking to people through research is that having people who ease that process, who actually help that happen, is almost necessary in large organizations to make that collaboration real. 
and even to witness it, to report it back to management so that they understand what's happening and can actually then support that whole system. So I'm going to ask now, in terms of your experiences, Tommy, we will start with you. What do you see in terms of the crossover, like the similarities? So if you have, for example, an OSPO, and who here has maybe an organisation that has an actual open source programme office already in place? So good for you, right? And of those, who does inner source practices within their OSPO? So they're actually, yeah, so, so, so. Okay, so, so let's talk about, you have an OSPO, right? You're, al you're already doing the things that we have heard about before that an OSPO might do. Um, where are the parallels or the opportunities for how you might think about doing inner source programs alongside what might be already happening with an open source program office? Yeah, so I think in, in terms of the guidance and best practices, uh, you know, the, there is a lot of crossover, um, you know, strong community, transparency, um, and um, just, you know, valuing your contributors. So, uh, like I said, we, you know, in, in a source came from open source. Like we, we, we saw open source being an effective way of building software. Um, we thought, oh, we we want to we want to see that uh, in in internal software as well. Um, so yeah, for for guidance, I think there's a lot of crossover. I think in terms of making it happen, I think that's where it's quite a bit different. Um, like you were saying, Claire, with the um, the, the motivations are very different. Like um, at least in my experience. The motivation for making an inner source contribution is normally to solve a business problem. So you have an internal shared library and the team that maintains that um, is swamped and you have requirements going in, but they're like, oh yeah, we'll put it on the backlog. And then a couple of quarters later, it's still on the backlog. Um, whereas within a source, you can unblock yourself. So yeah, un understanding those different motivations, I think would be important for, for uh, an OSPO looking to promote inner source and um, understand what the value is um, and then the other side of it is um, you you kind of have uh, I don't know about more levers but different levers uh, to, to make inner source work so um, something that we've tried is things like developer exchanges where if you're interested in contributing to an inner source project just go and join that team for a week um, maybe, you know, uh, if you're co-located, maybe go and sit down and do some pair programming uh, with somebody or even remote, you can still do do pair programming. Um, so that's some of the kind of similarities and differences that I've seen. Thanks, Tom. Russ, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I'm trying to think about uh, what I can add. That was a, a really good summary. Um, I'll just uh, talk about some of the similarities, which uh, the mindset and mechanics that we want to see are, I think, are very similar between open, open and inner source. Uh, I, th I think, and I, I disclosure, I haven't worked in an OSPO before. So this is my understanding of what would happen in an OSPO. But there's a, a, a contribution and a reusage mindset that we want to see. You know, if there's code to be developed, is it differentiating for my company? Uh, if so, great, work on the code yourself. If it's not differentiating for a company, is there something open source we can use so our development time can be focused on what's going to move the company forward? I think uh, an easy way to introduce inner source with that same mindset is to bring that inside to your business unit, or your product or team when working on something for the roadmap to ask yourself, is this specific to my product that I'm working on or my business unit? Uh, if not, uh, well, I mean, it's kind of two levels of questions. I guess to start, is it differentiating for the company? The answer might be yes, but then, we, you know, there's a second question that needs to be asked, but kind of at the same point in the, the planning uh, your thought life cycle? Is it for differentiating for my team or my business unit? If the answer is no, that's an opportunity for an inner source project. And again, for the same reason. So the resources of that business unit or that team can go into the reason that that business unit te or team existed and avoid uh, these, these silos uh, forming. And uh, I guess on some of the, uh, another opportunity, uh, I guess that I want to put for uh, an OSPO with inner source is to for any uh, material tooling documentation that isn't an OSPO can be run as an inner source project with contributors from around the company. 
So if there's, um, again, if you have some docs about how uh, open source works in your particular company, you can host that uh, internally and, and have that be something that's contributed to from around the company. So maybe people might be learning how to make a contribution to another project by practicing on a documentation or a tool project that's run uh, by your OSPO. So you can get help uh, running the OSPO and then train more, more people with the mechanics of open source. Um, I'll say, I guess, two more, two more things. I think this training on the mechanics of doing a contribution is also a big opportunity for an OSPO that wants to see more people that know how to engage with open source. As Tom said, people can kind of get driven to inner source because there's something on the roadmap where they're blocked and need to unblock themselves. And these may people that be people that otherwise really don't have an interest in open source, but they do have an interest in delivering on their particular roadmap. So if they get stuck in this situation and the answer becomes you need to, you and your team need to make an inner source contribution to unblock yourself, it's a, a way of getting more people aware of the mechanics of how it works to contribute to another project. Uh, so you can broaden the number of people in your organization that are trained in this way of thinking. And then down the line, there are more people with this mindset. It may bring more that are able to contribute externally. Um, I think I just want to, I guess, double down on the point that uh, Tom uh, made about the different motivations and levers between open source and inner source. For me, I think it's one of the key reasons why inner source uh, can be thought of as a related, but a, a separate uh, practice from open source in that even though we want to see the same type of collaborative behavior, you know, of community forming and many people involved and we have maintainers and contributors, like the end result we like to see, I think it looks very much the same for an open and inner source project. But the context is so different. When you think about uh, the time in which people are contributing, is it uh, some are during the workday, but in open source, some people it's a, a, in the community, it's something they're passionate about, so maybe outside of working hours. Uh, so the motivations are different, the time of day you're contributing can be different. With inner source, we expect to see quite a bit more, you know, majority or near exclusively people that are contributing during their working hours, they're doing their maintenance during their working hours, and everything else that happens in their workday is happening in the background. Uh, they might be part of some quarterly goals that their team is trying to achieve. They may be involved in sprint planning and backlog grooming and have a, a, a time box uh, in which they need to deliver something. And all their inner source is happening with all those other constraints. So even though we want to see the same result, the mechanisms and the levers that we might uh, pull or uh, put into place can look very different between inner and open source. So I think it's something to be intentional about when having uh, open source and an inner source separate at a company and uh, to not blindly uh, apply the same approach in both cases, thinking that the same result will happen. So I, I just wanted to add um, that that idea of uh, inner source being a way of training up people in open source practices and you know uh, whether that's working asynchronously, um, doing pull requests. Like what I think what we see, what I've seen both at the BBC and in the inner source commons is it, there is a really big skills gap here with. Uh, open source development like i'm i'm guessing the people in this room and the people at this conference are you know relatively well skilled in things like forking and branching and, and pull requests but um you know we beginners to this to this way of working they can get blocked on that very first step they go oh i want to write some code for, for this inner source project Oh, but if I I don't have commit rights to make a branch, um, or if they're used to committing directly to main, they don't have commit rights to go to main. And then I've I've seen people be worried, like, oh well, if I fork this, will it then make it public and it's in its private code? So I can't fork it, or else it'll magically go public on GitHub. So us as uh, as open source people, we need to really understand the, the skills gap and, and how difficult it is um, for, uh, for for people new to this. Um, it, yeah, it, there is a really big skills gap. And um, just one one more point on the kind of inner source and open source uh, relationship. So yeah, inner source is a great way to train people up, and inner source can be a good way to get a project ready for open source. Um, but 
you kind of need to be explicit about that, whether the intention is to open source it in the long run or not. Because um, I've I've seen some uh, projects be put off in a source because they think, well, we don't want to open source this, so we're not going to do in a source. It's like, no, you you can do either for for whatever situation is appropriate. Thanks, Tom. And I just want to add into some of the points you were making there. So one of the other things that I think in terms of, you know, maybe thinking about what you could reuse from an OSFO in an, in an ISFO context, um, it is important, to, again, to realise that although those mechanisms may be similar, uh, back to the previous discussion about even who might be contributing in an inner source context, they, they may not know the terminology that is very familiar for people in the open source world. Um, but actually, getting your documentation for projects in the open source world, not assume knowledge of open source practices, but actually be geared towards people who don't have that knowledge, is probably good practice anyway, if we're trying to expand the number of contributors in open source world, right? So so there's, there's something about the idea that even the practice of um, seeing the usability of things like readmes and contribution guides go beyond who you might think would be good contributors, but to people that you don't expect to be good contributors and have them useful for those sorts of people can really expand your, your, your reach into a set of people um, that, that might grow the number of contributors in the future for open source projects that you may be uh, associated with or, 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 or uh, wanting to actually see be successful. Um, I'll also go a little bit further on that skills aspect. So for me, um, when, I, when, when we think about the value of inner source that people talk about, and let's be honest here, right? If you're sitting in an open source program right, office right now, if you're sitting anywhere in an organization these days, you are concerned with, well, what business value does my organization give? How do I actually communicate that? How do I ensure the sustainability of this effort? Everyone's involved in those sort of discussions at some point where they're thinking about making sure that their efforts are sustained. And the more opportunities you have to give value back to the business, I think the better. So for me as well, the, the idea of thinking about inner source, if you're sitting in an OSPO, um, there's value in that because there is a potential extra value that you could add back. And some of that is, is just the breaking down the silos and perhaps the, the reuse of code within your company, which, you know, if, if it's a big enough piece of reuse, you can, you can really demonstrate that you're providing more efficiency, developer efficiency within your, within your organization. Tom mentioned the idea of um, the acceleration of getting to your end goal. So, so you have a potentially bigger opportunity to create that impact within your company that you might, these sort of value propositions that you might already be selling on the basis of using open source code could be extended. So that's one thing. But the biggest thing for me that's the most exciting about this is come from some of the research we've done in Intersource Commons around why people contribute to Intersource projects. And I think this may be actually similar to what's happening in the open source world, but it's not something I had been kind of focusing on up until we saw this come through in the, in the research. And that is that no matter why organizations think all of this is a good idea, because it's usually something to do with efficiency and productivity and yada, 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 um, people love it because it actually gives them an opportunity to learn, to learn and to make connections across the company. Now that's, there are always value propositions that have been huge in the open source world, right? Like it's, it's people being able to scratch their own itch, learn, find new networks, build relationships, have great community. If you can offer that within an organization, as well as within the open source community, you're providing additional real value to companies. And we've seen people in inner source commons talk about inner source as a pathway to develop skills, to actually create succession pipelines, to identify talent across the organization, because they're not waiting for people to apply for a job. They're seeing who knows their code already and actually able to then provide succession plans and development within the organization. So, Russ, yeah, can, I, yeah, please. Yeah, can I add on to this? wasn't part of my prepared remarks, and I don't know how to translate this to value, but uh, in my... My last role when I was at, at Nike doing Intersource, um, uh, it's amazing in that being a contributor and being a trusted committer, maintainer of an Intersource project is being a leader. 
And one thing that I did not expect at all when I started Intersource is the way it gave leadership training and leadership opportunities to people who were not bestowed from on high with a title as leader and maybe didn't know that you can lead from any position, but Intersource gave a chance for them to raise their hand and say, I, you know, I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to be contributing to this, this product. And at least in my, my time at Nike, uh, I was uh, surprised uh, there, there are many women uh, uh, women who were not getting leadership opportunities um, uh, uh, on their teams for whatever reason, who came out and had had leadership opportunities through Intersource and were able to use that to then advocate for themselves either inside or outside the company for bestowed and you know recognized with a title leadership positions. I didn't expect it. And I had several people I, I talked to, both uh, male and female, that told me this was the best part of their job, you know, if it weren't for this, uh, I wouldn't be here. Thank you for the opportunity. And I was actually, it was like a business person. I was just trying to be efficient. <laughs> I mean, I was always nice to people, yeah, but yeah. Um, it really, it really, uh, it, it really touched and humbled me. And I don't know if I can translate that into what it meant for the company, but at as a personal level, uh, I was in the point where I knew somebody's like life had been touched and changed uh, because of, of Intersource. And it's uh, something that still uh, gets me a little welled up in side thinking about it. It's a, a, a privilege and the company may or may not appreciate it, but um, uh, I know at a personal level, I, I did, they did, and, and you will. Thanks, Ross. Um, so we might just open it up now to see if anyone has any questions, please. Um, and we, we will wait to get the mic so we can get it on the recording. Do a little run. Hi, uh, Carla Niemen and the name and question has kind of two parts. First part is that uh, how does it usually work with inner source projects? Like my understanding of open source projects is that there is always some kind of main maintainer workload. Like, so is this also in inner source projects? And then how did you, how do you consider this? Like which projects to open to inner source? Because like if I'm a tech lead who doesn't want this extra workload, maybe I don't want to open my project. Two mics. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks for for asking about that. This is part of what an ISPO can provide, which is governance or expectations uh, for an inner source project. I'm glad that you recognize the workload. And one thing I want to include in my remarks, which I'll I'll say now because it's kind of related to your question, is uh, a common anti pattern uh, that we have is that inner source projects need no governance. Um, Maybe you've seen this in open source. We open source it and the collaboration will just happen. Uh, we see that in, in Intersource sometimes too. In fact, I've heard teams say before, and please never say this, and, and, and if anyone says it, you can correct them. Uh, I've, I've heard teams say, well, we, we don't really have time to maintain this. I guess we'll just intersource it, and then the community can take care of it. You, know, you just throw it out there and someone will catch it. You know, that doesn't happen. It takes, it takes real amounts of, of time involved. And this was your question, like uh, what should be uh, what should be intersourced? Uh, is there is there time involved? And the answer is is anything. It depends. It can have a few uh, patterns. This is part of where an ISPO can help if there's a recognized set of intersource projects. Um, uh, one thing an ISPO can do is to help to advocate for those. Uh, at Wellsky, uh, uh, where I um, where I'm the director of intersource, we track usage of intersource projects, and we had one that was in this state where there weren't a set of maintainers. Yet we, we had. Uh, 73 uses across the company of active projects that were still being deployed. And we were able to use that to advocate with management for maintainer time. So that's a role that we filled as an ISPO. And now that project has like a great set of community maintainers. Uh, as far as uh, what to put into Intersource, uh, an ISPO might provide guidelines. My opinion is that you know, we kind of leave that to the, you know, community, like at the company, what do we think, what do they think will be useful? Uh, we trust that they'll probably know, know better. Um, uh, so uh, I guess the last thing I'll say is if people don't want to, I've never been in a position of forcing people uh, to, to inner source, but I think it's really interesting if there's a desire from some people to collaborate on something as inner source, there's demand for that. And if there's a desire not to, that maybe the cost of it isn't meeting that demand, and that's an opportunity for uh, someone in an ISPO position to examine why there's that difference and think again to what Tom said, there's so many levers you can pull. There's, uh, if you have an ISPO that has good relationships with engineering leaders, we can talk about expectations for 
teams, expectations for career levels, uh, ways that team success is reported. Maybe inner source needs to be a measure of success. And with those levers, you can look at what you can do to resolve that situation. So it's not an answer, but those are some thoughts about it. Yeah, and I think uh, this is a great time to plug the inner source patterns, uh, which is one of the, the outputs of the inner source commons, um, because a lot of these challenges come up in loads of different companies. Um, so uh, one pattern that we have is the core team pattern, and this is where it's been recognized that the, the yeah, kind of maintaining an inner source project is so costly that you actually need to um, get some resource around that, get a team to, to look after that. Um, something else, uh, I think uh, it's an open pull request uh, on the patterns repo. We've been talking a bit about uh, including um, including capacity for supporting inner source in your agile planning. Um, so, you know, don't don't expect to be able to like completely fill your sprint with project work. You need to leave some capacity free to s support contributions. Um, and in terms of um, uh, another ISPO activity could be uh, keeping an eye on and identifying abandoned projects. I think the same can be true for open source. Like if you've got an abandoned inner source or open source project with your company's name on it, like you either want to find a new owner for it um, and make sure it's maintained properly or potentially even deprecate it, um, which is a hard thing to do, but maybe that's better than having unsupported, unmaintained code. As someone said, let them die. I'm going to add one more thing to that because um, we we actually conduct a, a survey every year called State of Inner Source within the Inner Source Commons. And this year we asked about what projects people considered to be successful inner source projects. Um, and actually the, the feedback we got back were the, the top ones were actually projects that were designed to be shared. So, so the folks that are actually building something like a platform project or common library, they want other people to use it and therefore they want those other people people to feel like they've got a stake in that development and a, and a pathway for them to have some degree of autonomy and not be blocked in case. So if you're going to ask another team to have a dependency on you because you're building a common thing, then you need to give them a pathway to be involved in that process and inner source gives you that. The third most common thing, because it was kind of like plat you know, common libraries and platform projects, third one hit me like I was like, whoa, I didn't realize that was going to be a thing. Um, and that was documentation as code. So it turned out, and in particular actually in the Japanese community, it turned out that an awful lot of people who were experimenting with inner source, they started with documentation as code as a way to have, a, have people kind of contribute, learn open source practices, but in a way that perhaps wasn't as um, challenging or, or they didn't have a steeper learning curve by, by not having to understand the code base and go through that whole kind of code awareness, but they could actually just, you know, contribute to the documentation in a way that, um, that would help the entire project. That not only, I suppose, was, was a success, seen to be a successful inner source project, but it actually, again, hit a wider number of people who were, who were potential contributors in that respect. Um, so they were considered to be particularly successful inner source projects. Sorry, there were other questions here. I, I'll just go back to here and then we'll come down here. Thanks. <laughs> um, uh, how do you organize in a source in a company that's uh, distributed across jurisdictions, let's say, because it impacts and is impacted by taxation, data protection regulation, cross-border data transfer, export control, that sort of stuff? Yeah, so, so uh, again, I'll, I'll plug the patterns again, um, because we, we've seen people have this problem. Um, so there's an inner source license pattern for, uh, for, for trans, um, what's the term? Trans transfer pricing. Transfer pricing, yeah. Um, so I don't have the answer because I work for a single country um, corporation, but... Uh, Claire, yeah, so so sorry. I, I just I also know that there are some actual um, uh, research projects that actually examine this, and there's some actual papers available because some research has been specifically focusing on that area, and they're actually even uh, provided with mechanisms by which you can actually account for contributions across jurisdictions and things like that, um, and methods for um, how you might account for that in the context of transfer pricing. So there there is a lot of material on that. 
Yeah, there is material in the inner source commons, and you can find uh, a handful of talks on this topic on our YouTube channel. If you look for inner source commons on YouTube and just uh, search for transfer pricing, yeah, I think there's three or four that'll pop up. So you can see examples of how others have approached this. I'll say this is a very active topic in the inner source commons. I'm hoping that we'll do some publishing in the upcoming year, you know, white paper or some writing in addition to kind of the case studies that have been shared on YouTube. So check out the YouTube channel at our website, innersourcecommons.org. There's a link to join our Slack and you can also put out your question there and, uh, and chat with other practitioners. Great question, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we have established that one of the pillars of ESPOs is education, right? Um, as ESPOs, we want to maintain healthy and uh, a healthy inner source ecosystem within our projects. Where do you set the line on spending efforts between smoothing the experience for uh, the the, the uh, project maintainers and, and 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 the projects in inner source? Uh, between that and hand-holding the specific projects onto good software engineering practices like breaking a monorepo into microservices and so on and so forth, so that you as OSPO dedicate the most valuable efforts in the right direction without losing so much time by hand-holding and educating these teams, no? Okay. All right. Yeah, so much of what makes open and inner source work is just good engineering practices, uh, documentation, keeping dependencies up to date, having a, a, a test run, uh, being able to build and run the project uh, locally, modular design, good architecture. So there's so much of that. And, it's, and some of it's kind of this pre-work that kind of needs to be done before it's really easy to use or contribute someone else's stuff. So uh, my opinion, your ISPO or OSPO will probably always be underfunded to actually do these things. Uh, so at least the tack that I've taken um, uh, and, and recommend is to seek out allies who are also interested in those things and collaborate with them and to help them uh, roll out. So in my career, I've found consistent allies in the architecture team, like architects around the company are usually your friends because they want things to be well designed and you know, reused if possible. Uh, the security team uh, can be an ally as well. And if there's a quality or testing team, um, they all wanna see these good practices rolled out as well. So in my, uh, in my role at WellSky, at least I have really tight collaborations with all of them. One, because if they're successful, Intersource will be more successful. And also for them to be successful, one of the best ways for them to roll out their best practices is for them to have Intersource projects that everyone consumes and contributes to. So they're, uh, they're usually good candidates for wanting to like host Intersource projects because they want to make stuff that's used all over. And as they're successful, Intersource becomes easier. So that's one strategy. I'm going to add, uh, I think, hot off the press new pattern that I literally just heard in the previous talk that I think could be applied to inner source from open source. So in the talk before this, if you care to look at it or if any of you has been there, it was by Stephen Wally. He was talking about educating um, around uh, open source projects through internships. And he spoke about um, this concept, which I think is so powerful, called near peer mentorship. Has, that, has anyone heard this? As opposed to mentorship mentorship, which assumes that the senior maintainers has to deal with every potentially stupid incoming PR that, you know, from someone who maybe doesn't know a lot and has to kind of, you know, that, that can be very frustrating for people, right? That if you, if you, I've opened up my project and now the first five PRs are things that they really should have known better, you know, and, and now suddenly they've had a really bad experience with, you know, dealing with all of those. And it's like, I'm done, I'm done. I can't be dealing with any more of this. That's very difficult. Um, but this principle is the idea that actually that kind of real expert novice type mentorship is not as powerful as near peer mentorship. So you get someone successfully through the process and you get them to mentor the next person. And so they may not even be in the team at all. Um, but the idea of this idea of identifying people who've just gone through the process to help the people who are next along the process can be really powerful for both the people who are submitting the contribution and for the team itself, because it, it actually helps grow everyone along the, the pathway. So near peer mentorship, a new one for me, and is going to be a pattern, I think, soon. And there was, sorry. No, you, yeah, go for it. Did you want to? Yeah. 
Uh, hi. Uh, sorry, I joined the session late. So if it, if uh, you know someone has already asked this question, I'm really sorry for that. But I really like that you pointed out that you know uh, the contributors uh, who are contributing to InnoSource, they will learn, they will build the connections across the organization. But I think one of the key problem is that developers already have a lot of work other than inner sourcing as well, and uh, they are. And if you look at the business leaders, they are actually paying those developers to deliver that kind of work. And with inner source, typically the ROI is measured with time, right? I mean, you cannot have an immediate impact of inner source. Uh, it, it takes time to measure the developer productivity and efficiency and all of those things. So during that time, how to keep, you know, how many developers, have you seen any developers who are actually contributing to inner source just for the learning purpose and just for the building connection purpose rather than, you know, even if they are not getting direct salary for it or earnings for it? Yeah, I'd say, um... One thing I, th I have seen work in terms of that using InnerSource purely for learning and not for uh, you know, completing a ticket on your board is um, uh, using 10% time. Um, and I, I suppose maybe this is slightly cheeky, right? Because maybe someone in their 10% time would do a, a, a personal project or do a training course. But by getting them to use their 10% time to do an InnerSource contribution, not only are they learning, but that is also adding some business value. So yeah, maybe it's slightly cheeky to use 10% time in that way, but I have seen that work. I'm just going to add, because you, you were talking about like measuring inner source and the value and all that, like it actually happens like that. But actually, the whole ability to measure return on investment and value is very immature in organisations. Actually, the folks that are doing transfer pricing mitigations are probably further along because they have to kind of quantify the amount of IP that's travelling between jurisdictions, etc. So they have mechanisms to do that. Um, but but the I say, I'd say the maturity of measuring like exactly how much time did we save by this? We had we had a discussion about this in the inner source gathering there on Monday. It, it's it's not well developed. So if you're waiting for that to be your business value, as in I, I'm going to have a magic number, I wave at management, it's not going to happen anytime soon. So I would I would also say that that in the context of of describing this value, um, you know, part of it is actually just telling the stories. And actually, just because, you know, you, you were kind of like, I'm waiting for this magic number, but like, you know, people are learning. Tr turns out that actually when management hear about the stories that people tell about their experiences with InnerSource, it's very compelling. Like they, they talk about, you know, skills transfer. They talk about being unblocked, that they, they, they might have to wait. Otherwise, how, you know, in, in their project planning, they have a thing to say, well, you know, we, we tried to get that other team to, to, to do something, but they wouldn't. We had to wait like six months and sit in our hands for a while and you know it's not our fault like and then you hear about inner source unblocking something like that that can be far more powerful than potentially a magical dollar number at the end of the year or something like that so yeah, it's I just mean, a comment on measurement i mean if, if you think about open source 25 years ago i mean that was kind of uh it, it was a leap of faith in some ways it was people intuitively believed it was the best way to build software and it's only really now that um, we have the, the evidence to say yes, that was the right decision, and you know, open source won. Open source winning was the the best result for the industry. So um, I guess obviously we believe that the same will happen with inner source eventually. Um, but yeah, it's still new enough that it is a bit of a leap of faith. But intuitively, it just makes sense that if it works in the open, it should work in in the closed. So, so those case studies are internally are sometimes more powerful than some sort of effective system of measuring things. And those case studies can be at that project level or at an individual level describing how powerful it is. Because I mean, like, so you heard, you just heard Russ talking about welling up, right? Managers do that too, would you believe? Like they actually are really moved by stories about collaboration and how, how like I, I heard one from a case study from Microsoft where they were, it was, it was community of practice around, um, uh, they, they weren't even developers, they were the um, Microsoft uh, uh, folks, consultants in the field. And they were doing an inner source project where they were just sharing best practices about their consultancy practice, where they were, they were, they were editing the documentation that goes out to all the other consultants worldwide 
while they were on the customer site. New question from customer A goes into the repo, gets pulled into a PR, someone answers it, it goes back out within a day. None of this like kind of going up the field, getting some question, having an editorial board, blah, 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 blah publishing it out, blah, blah, blah. It was all done with the inner source project within a day. And they, the way, the, the thing that, I mean, that's impressive enough, right? But then the way they talked about it, in terms of all these people from the, the far reaches of Microsoft who felt that they were in peripheral offices, were all talking about their connection to the mothership and how, how well, they didn't say that, I, I said that, but, uh, but they, they were talking about how the, um, their, their ability to feel connected and impactful, even though they were in the field and they weren't at the center of the Microsoft operations, was huge. And actually, I welled up hearing them talk about it. So, okay. It's, it, Emotions like that, telling those stories, can be very powerful. Do we have time for more questions, or are we at time? I think we yeah. may have time. Um, I mean, I think we're over time, but there's nothing after this, and I can do, oh, five, yeah. I can do five more minutes. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, then we might, people may have to go to the <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks for Claire for hosting, everyone for being here. Yes, thank you. Thanks,